This is Neil Rockine. Welcome to another episode of the Killer Cross-Examination Podcast. Uh, if you like our content, first of all, you can find it on any podcast platform anywhere, Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, you name it. Um, subscribe, like, we love that. And week in and week out, we're bringing you some of the very best criminal defense lawyers, best trial lawyers that I know or that uh, I'm able to track down. And speaking of amazing trial lawyers, um, it's my uh, privilege to, to introduce and to welcome uh, Jose Baez to the podcast. Jose, you need no introduction. Um, so I just wanted to, first of all, thank you. I've told you I'm, a, I'm a, a big fan of your approach to cases and your approach to the law, and um, it's just an honor to have you here. Thanks so much, Neil. I appreciate the invitation, and I'm glad we, we were able to make it happen. So, Jose, tell, tell I know that you're a criminal defense lawyer. I know you do a lot more than that. Um, a lot of your cases are, are, are so well known. I know you have some that have been high profile and some that have, have not. And I, but tell me, if you would, let's start, if we could, about how you got into the practice of law. I think that's a pretty fascinating story. Well, um, it's not as fascinating as, as many would probably think. Um, I was going to go into law enforcement. That was my original intent. Um, I had gone to Florida State and got my degree in criminology. My last semester of law school um, is when I made the decision to actually apply to law school. Um, it was kind of funny. I was uh, dating my college sweetheart who was going to, to law school and she asked me if I could go, if, if I wanted to go, that I, she basically recommended it. And my response was, I'm not smart enough to be a lawyer. <laughs> um, so you're, you're out of your mind. And um, it was literally her belief in me that, that, that made me say, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. And uh, it wasn't a smooth road. It wasn't a smooth ride by, by any means, but um, somewhere along the line, I fell in love with it. And um, it seemed to be like, to the point where I really can't imagine myself doing anything else as, 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 as hard as I tried. Were you always, um, have you always been a, a, a criminal defense lawyer or a defender, or did you start as some do in a prosecutor's office or in another area and just kind of graduate to criminal defense and to um, civil rights litigation? Well, that's, that's a more interesting story. Um, my, the end of my second year of law school, um, I always knew I wanted to do criminal uh, work. So um, at the, the beginning of the summer, I had an internship lined up at the state attorney's office here in Miami. And I went and I lasted one day. <laughs> um, I just realized it wasn't for me. It wasn't for me. I didn't. I, the The only way I could describe it was anger, uh, and and the the confrontational aspect of it all. The the accusatory nature of it all just didn't sit well with me. So I literally crossed the street and went to the public defender's office the next day and asked if I could intern there. They were more than happy to have me. And that's literally where I just absolutely fell in love with defense work. I, I think there's so much that you get from being a public defender that you don't get from being a state attorney. Uh, and that's no knock on, on state attorneys, but you don't have clients. You really don't learn how to cross-examine because most defendants don't put on a case. And if they do, guess who's testifying? <laughs> um, so that's one aspect. And then the other thing is that you learn a lot of strategy. You don't learn that at, at, as a prosecutor because law enforcement pretty much dictates what your strategy is going to be. Whereas there are so many chess pieces in a defense case that I think it really opens the door to a lot of creativity and that's what I think I, I'm most passionate about when it comes to defense work is being able to take a case and, and dismantle it and and create our own case and and really put put forth 
a lot of um, strategic thinking and, and, and creative uh, work as it relates to criminal defense. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it does. It, it, it does because <laughs> I, I was a I was a prosecutor for um, for three and a half years, and you know I. I I sort of tell the story about how I left like on a Friday and was walked into court on a Monday um, as a, you know, as a defense lawyer. And you think to yourself, it's only a few feet apart uh, in the courtroom, but, but it really is um, miles apart in terms of approach, in terms of, you know, the, what you should say, shouldn't say, what you have to know, don't know. I mean, as a prosecutor, Jose, I could sit there and I could almost, the young lawyers that didn't know what to say when they came into court, I could almost like do it for them. You know what I mean? Because I because I didn't know the client. It wasn't my case. It wasn't my client. It wasn't really on my back, right? But then all of a sudden you get in there and you're representing somebody and you're like, uh, uh, and then, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, wave reading. Your Honor, we're going to wave the reading of the... <laughs> You know, because it's it's all different. It's it, it's it's only a few feet apart, but it really in turn in distance, but in actual like significance, it is it's miles apart. It starts with the tough with one uh, with step number one, which is always tough, and that's remembering your client's name. <laughs> <laughs> so I and the strategizing is different. I mean, you 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 touched on something which is so important, which is that the the. And I want to I want to flush this out. You've you've been involved in so many cases, and your cross examination skills and your approach is so I I I think notable. Um, and you tell a story when you're in cross examination. And you do you ever know when you're telling when you're cross examining a witness when you've reached a point that that it's that the jury gets it? Do you ever just say, okay, they get it, I've got it, or do you continue on through? The, the what you have sort of prepared or in your head for the cross examination, regardless. No, I don't ever think they get it, um, and and I think that's um, what you try to do is avoid the traps of defense lawyers, which are uh, your own hubris. And unless we can ask them and 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 uh, know for certain, there's really no way of knowing. So you have to follow through with what your plan is, what your story is, what your approach should be. Obviously, there are times, there, there's a thing called timing, and that's important as well. So I, I don't want to contradict that rule. But generally speaking, I think, you know, trials are long, trials are complex, and sometimes facts get muddled up. So the more repetition you have, the, the better you'll know that it's going to stick with them throughout the end of the trial, especially if you're trying some, a, a case that's complex and, and it's going to it, it's going to be a while before it actually gets to the jury. You definitely have to just keep reinforcing it, reinforcing it, reinforcing it. And um, I, I, I do believe there's such a thing as overkill. So you have to get creative in the different ways you say the same thing. So um, that's that's really an important thing. Like I, I, I just tried a case not too long ago where the co-defendant was represented by a young lawyer and, and I pulled him aside and I told him, look, um, your approach with, with this set of witnesses has been great, but it's time to try something new because you're losing the jury. They're here, they've heard it multiple times. You gotta find new ways of saying that as opposed to the same way of saying it. And that's where I think you lose them. Uh, so, uh, so can you get, part. can you give me an example? That's such a great point. Can you give me, can you think of an example, even if you don't want to use that particular case where you're, where you want to see, you, you want to say, you want to continue with your theme, but you don't want to, but you don't want to, to, to be repetitious and, and, and repeat yourself. Sure. Um, this last case was a federal case that involved uh, harboring and uh, harboring of, of undocumented workers. So the, the young lawyer was asking questions about uh, physical aspects of harboring and basically asking the same, the qu same questions again and again and again with all of the different undocumented workers that were testifying. 
And it got to the point where everybody knew what the answers were and everyone knew what the, what the questions were gonna be. So when I, when I talked to them, I said, find different examples. Don't use the same examples, use it different ways. And then that way you're not only keeping them awake, but you're also covering every single base that you could possibly imagine. Uh, so, uh, if, fortunately, he was he was very open minded and, and welcomed the advice, and and uh, he did just that. So, uh, and his client got acquitted. So, uh, I, I think that's an important thing. Repetition is very important. You just gotta do it in different ways. So, I, I want to ask you about a couple of different things that I've noticed that you do. So, I, in and I've I followed the Casey Anthony trial, although not as closely as I followed the Aaron Hernandez trial, and certainly not neither of those as closely as I followed the William Hussle trial, which was, um, and and I I, I want to ask a sort of a common thread that I see in all three of those is that you try your own case. You're trying. You appear to me to have a theme, to have an approach, and that. In some respects, it's clear the state is trying one case, and you're in a way trying another. Um, and it's sort of a who's what narrative, what narrator is going to be more credible, more likable, is going to have the facts sort of support them. That's what I've sort of noticed as a theme in the way that you've approached at least those three cases. Well, yes, I, I, I would. I, I tell you, that's exactly what um, my point is when we when we try cases. You always want to make sure you're controlling the narrative. I don't. I, I never want to try a case where I'm playing defense the entire time. Um, but we're always believing that the best defense is an offense. And um, as it relates to cases, once you start controlling the narrative in the case, then uh, it's a problem for the prosecutors because now they're repeating your version of the case. So if they if they are not, you know, like there's different ways of looking at prosecutions. A lot of defense lawyers believe that, and I'm not necessarily, I'm also included in this group, is a lot of times prosecutors will try their case regardless of what is coming out in the evidence. Uh, and their own mother can testify uh, differently, and they don't care. They're going to still stay, stick to their uh, line of case and, and their narrative. And I think that's a big mistake because uh, you have to address the evidence. So if we're putting forward a case and putting forward a narrative and they're not responding to it, they're not eliminating every reasonable doubt. Because we're not coming with something outrageous like he was he was not here, he was having dinner on the moon. So <laughs> you know, so for that reason, they are we're putting forward what we believe are reasonable arguments, reasonable hypothesis of innocence. And if they don't address it, that, that's that's uh that's gonna be to their detriment. And if they do address it, they're now controlling your they're now repeating your narrative. So I I I think that approach. It has multiple benefits, and, and and once you get it going, I really don't think there's any way to stop it. So when you said there's no, because I I agree, because that it it got to a point, for example, during the Aaron Hernandez trial, where um, as I was watching the trial, it was first of all you have a a, a, a you appear to be so pleasant and polite with the jury and the judge, even when the judge may not be going your your way. Um, I don't know where you, you develop that style. I don't know if you just go to the gym. I'll ask you, how do you do that in the face of so much, you know, I mean, there's so much on the line and the, in the, there's, it's people are gunning for you in some respects. Um, how do you maintain that level of politeness and pleasantness? Because you, it, it it shows. You seem like you're the most polite, pleasant person in the courtroom. It's almost like, it's almost like you're not even, you know, I, I don't know. It just seems like you, you're pleasant and polite, and you introduce yourself to the judge and the jurors and the clerk and the staff and the prosecutor. Um, you know, 
um, it just comes across as very likable. Well, I, I, I think. <laughs> I mean, is that uh, is that, is that how you are in life? Really, it, it's really humbling when people tell me this, you know, that that I'm likable or this and that in the courtroom, and, and I really appreciate it. But I think it comes from somewhere. I don't think I'm I'm naturally likable. I don't think anyone is. <laughs> I think you have to you have to put forth the effort to be likable, and you have to uh, try and, um, and and show that you care. And the reason I think I work the way I do is because I'm always remembering the consequences and who I'm there for. Uh, the client, this is the client's life. This is their fight. This is nothing personal towards me. This is nothing personal uh, in attacking me. And I know I get to go home each night and if I wanna have a steak, I'm gonna do that. If things go south for my client, that's not gonna happen. So, so I'm always thinking of them. I'm always thinking of their families and, and the consequences. Good Lord, you know, the, the, these consequences and, and, and the cases, they're not cases, they're causes. And, and there's someone's life. And, and what we do doesn't only affect one person. It affects everyone they love, their community. And, and it's kind of like a ripple effect when you throw a rock down uh, down a, a river or, or or a lake. And I just I, I just it scares me. It scares me to lose. It scares me to to um, what the consequences are. And it scares me if I'm the reason behind the loss, or my demeanor is the reason behind it, or or if I turn off a juror because. I get upset because a prosecutor is is attacking me, or a judge is is riding me uh, to no end. Uh, I, I I think if you want to be a lot tougher in the courtroom, you should remember that. I want to ask you a couple of questions about um, some some different things that I've seen you do. Um, first of all, in your uh, in the Aaron Hernandez case, I I watched. Um, the closing in which you actually had pictures. Um, I think it was almost on a, it might've been on a whiteboard, but I think they were, they might've had a, ma a magnet or they had something on the back of them that you were able to put them up on a, on a, on a, a chalkboard or a whiteboard. And you had a way of, of magnetic board, whatever it was to, to and to tell me about that. Was that because of the length of the trial? Was that because you wanted to be able to you had information you wanted to convey about each one. What was the point of, I thought it was very effective. It had a very, because I, I thought it was extremely effective to bring the people back in front of the jury, talk about them and talk about them on your terms. Um, but where did you get that idea and how did you, you know, and do you do that in every case? Just kind of talk me through that. I do that in an overwhelming majority of my cases, uh, especially if, if I have the ability to do so. So if the case is televised, perfect. I'll definitely have everyone's picture. <laughs> if, I don't, if, if it's not, um, we, you know, nowadays with social media and, and, and the internet, it's not too hard to find it. And if you don't, you can always use like a silhouette. Um, so I do it for multiple reasons. Um, and I've done it since, really since the Casey Anthony case. So it's, it's going on quite a few years that I've been doing this. I, and my rationale behind it um, is you, we forget how long closings and openings can be. So for example, on a complex case, you could be up there a couple of hours. That's longer than a movie. So Imagine yourself sitting through an entire movie where it's just someone talking to you, someone speaking. And you to can't, you. can't, you can't hit pause, and you can't. Right. So, right. so what I try to do, and if you notice with, with my with, with my demonstrative base, is I try and give the juror different perspectives, different ways of looking at things. So I'll use PowerPoint. That's a side thing. If I can use audio, I'll throw that in. If I can use video, I'll throw that in. If I can use um, timelines through uh, regular trial boards, I'll do that. Or if I can use magnets, and that's what I call the magnet boards, I'll do that and I'll go through each witness 
And you'll be surprised when you get through a case. Sometimes we'll throw pictures up there before I, when I'm organizing my closing. I'll throw pictures up there and I'll, I, and I'll forget who that person is. So if I'm forgetting who that person is and I cross examine them, I know the jury's probably have a hard, I'm gonna have a hard time. So the picture really does reinforce it visually for someone. And you really wanna give someone the different visualizations and different perspectives so they can constantly be alert and constantly be paying attention to you, uh, regardless of what's going on on TV. That's what's happening in the room. And in the room, it's hard for people to kind of stay focused for, for an extended period of time. So, you know, I know I get anxious after a long period of time sitting there listening to someone. So I try my best to remember that. And that's why I'll mix it up as best I can and give people really a different way of looking at things, even if it's just to get, to bring them back into focusing. And, and, and um, but I think it serves more than just that purpose. So for that reason, that's, that's why I utilize the, the, the magnet boards. And then something else I was gonna ask you about, not just the, the, the magnet boards, but um, in the middle of, of some of, of that, when I've seen you do that, there's some, I don't know if it's extemporaneous or if it's, but when, for example, in the, um, you can really sort of, because you're, 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 you're teaching, you're talking to the jurors at so many different levels. And when you, in the, in the Aaron Hernandez case, when you're talking about immunity for Alexander Bradley. They're handing out immunity in this case, like it's candy on, on, on Halloween. Mr. Hague is the next Oprah Winfrey. You've got immunity. You've got immunity. we all got immunity. Everybody's got immunity. I don't know if you, did you come up on the fly with the, with the Oprah quote with the, oh, was that on the fly? Did you just kind of come up with that? Or was that something you were thinking about? Because it came across so, so perfectly. Look at the, look at the cast of characters that they gave immunity to. Immunity for you and for you and you get immunity and you get immunity. We all get immunity. <laughs> yeah. um, actually, I would love to, to take credit for that one. And I'm, I'm a big believer in don't take credit for stuff that's not yours. So um, the way it was spontaneous to say it at that point in time, but I didn't come up with that joke. Actually, during lunch one day in the trial, um, someone had tweeted it. And Linda Kenny Bodden actually showed it to me, and we got a good chuckle out of it. And I said, I said, I should use that at closing. And I just said it like that. And then as I was going through my closing, it just seemed like the perfect time to throw it out there. So I threw it out there. But it, yeah, I, I don't practice jokes. So if something's funny during a closing, it, yeah. it's, it's coming well, straight Well, I was out. wondering, so do you, because we never see the jurors, obviously, when we're watching television. I, I, I'll tell you a little bit of, of from, from my approach. Um, when I've in the middle of a trial, when I'm, if you know, you have to be careful, obviously, about about humor. You don't want it to become, you don't want to, you know, become like a a, a vaude, you know vaudeville act in there. Um, but, but if there's a if there's a humorous moment and it feels like it's spontaneous and not forced. Um, there are times where I've, you know, where I've done that. And I, I, I can never see the, the jurors when you, I couldn't see them when you did that, but I watched it and I thought, oh, they had to be, the jurors had to be smiling and, and, and chuckling at that. I mean, they had to be. Although we got a lot, we got some bolsterous uh, laughs out of that one. Um, and there were a few other laughs. Um, I agree. I think humor is a very tricky thing, uh, especially in such serious matters. So you really have to know, uh, you really have to read the room and you have to know when it's appropriate because nothing could be worse when something doesn't work. And, and I've had that happen to me. Um, so, you know, I, I, I really did have that happen and, and I didn't, um, but you immediately have to, to react and realize, okay, that that's that's a no go. Get get back into into gear and and I think when I do my um, most of the times when I address humor, it's really in sarcasm uh, because and and I'm addressing uh, 
the government or the state's case uh, from a sar sarcastic point of view. And, and I think that's okay to do because that's what you're up there to do anyway, to argue. And do you, do you have, so is that something you would do in argument as opposed to in, in cross-examination or in, in, in opening? Or is it just something that kind of depends on the moment, depends how you it, feel in the moment? It really does depend on depend on the moment how you feel um so so to me i i, I just think i'm a, i'm a listener i'm a watcher I'm, I'm constantly observing so for me i think that's that's critically important to know to be able to read the room and understand who your audience is what they may or may not find funny what evidence is um is affecting them versus evidence that's not affecting them and, and I'm I'm constantly trying to to analyze that. Uh, my audience is by far the most important uh, group of people in the room, and uh, this is much to the uh, dismay of many judges. But I, I could care less what the judges' uh, opinions are, and I care everything about what my audience is. And and I I think if I could give a tip to lawyers, it's it's study them, study them because they're studying you, they're studying uh, your client, they're studying the case, and, and, it, and it's critical that you understand each other. Do you believe the jurors are watching you during the trial when you're sitting there at the at counsel table? Are they watching you and your client? For sure, for sure. Um, what do you tell your client about that? How do you tell your client? I mean, I'm not talking about a specific client, but when the client's sitting there and it's a long trial, uh, you, you know, what, what do you do at the table? What do you not do? What do you, um, what do you show the, I, 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 I tell you a funny story, if you don't mind. So you kind of, so part of the show, I'll show you mine. If you, know, you show me yours. Okay. I, I, I had a, I had a case years ago when I first started as a, as a working for a firm before I went off on my own. And I ended up having one of the lawyers that I was uh, working for. He thought one of the jurors had, had done something in the trial, had, had overheard a conversation in the hallway. And um, it was a conversation that shouldn't have been had in the hallway. And it was a conversation that shouldn't have been had probably in the courthouse, but he was having a conversation with the, the client in the hallway. And later when he came and he said, Hey, the jurors are, are the jurors are, uh, uh, I think a, a juror overheard me having a conversation. I'm like, well, what are you talking about? Like, how is that possible? Well, he walked over and said, could you take your conversation elsewhere? I'm like, okay, so he definitely heard you. Which juror was it? I don't know. Well, which where where are they seated? I don't remember. White or black? Uh, male or female? Uh, so we bring the jurors in to do like a juror lineup because you know. And I said, look, when the jurors come in, don't point because they're going to have no idea what what you're. But don't point. And as soon as the jurors come in, he's like, tap me on the shoulder, like point, and I'm I'm like, put your hand down. Don't need to point. Just just put your hand down. And the jurors walked out. And I remember that point as a, as a, cause the jurors, you know, they don't know why you're pointing. They don't know why he's looking over at them and then looking over at me and making out. They don't know. They don't know if it's, if, 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 if it's important or not. So I use that story when I talk to clients, cause I want to know, I listen, they, they have no idea when you're nodding your head or you're shaking your head. They don't know if it's in sympathy with the jurors, if it's in sympathy with the witness, they don't know. And they, it could all be misinterpreted. So I'm, I'm curious, like you, where, you know, what do you tell your clients? How do you act when you're at counsel table when, when the jury's in the room? I think one of the most important things is that they remember is they shouldn't be laughing. Um, and that's difficult because sometimes there are light moments in, in the courtroom and, and uh, everyone is laughing. And if they're not along the same lines, uh, it might uh, come across um, it, that, that this person is, has some kind of an attitude or something like that. So it's, there's a very delicate balance there. So I generally advise them, look, you know, we're not, it, it, we're not here to have fun. We're here for, for a serious uh, situation. I may not always be serious, but you need to always be. Um, and if there's a moment of, of you know, of humor, you, you should 
would react, but not too strongly. And you definitely don't want to be smiling and joking with the lawyers. And that's one thing I've had because I don't normally I'm not sitting alone. I have a team with me and I have other lawyers. Many of them are, are junior. And that's always a thing that I'm very alert of is what are my other lawyers doing? What kind of uh, faces are they making? What are they doing? Are they interacting with the client? And, and, and there's no room for that. So for that reason, that, that's the one thing that I, I, I keep um, everyone on a short leash with. But generally speaking, I try not to because I want them to seem sincere. I want them to see genuine and appear genuine. And, and that's a lot of what I do in cases. I don't practice openings or closings for that reason. It's because I want it all to come out authentic and real. And um, I, while I do kind of understand through an outline of how I'm gonna of what I'm gonna discuss, I, I never ever write out what I'm gonna say for that reason. It is it, it's really authenticity is paramount when it comes to winning cases and, and trying them the right way. Uh, I, I, I think I, I don't think I can overstate that enough. I mean some of your closings, you've had some incredibly long trials and I've watched some of the openings and closings. So if you don't write them out and you don't memorize them, do you have a, a do you have a way that you are able to sort of stay on topic and do you have an outline that you are following? Is it in your head? Kind of walk me through that. Well, I, I, I think the exhibits really guide me. So I know what order my, I'm going to present my exhibits. And if I'm at this exhibit, I know what I'm going to discuss with that exhibit. So a lot of times, yes, I'll have an outline, but that outline is really of my exhibits. So if you watch the, the Hussle trial or even Aaron's trial, or Casey's trial, you usually have a binder with uh, what the exhibits are showing. So I'll know what's coming next and I'll be able to transition from one aspect of the argument to another just simply by realizing what's coming down the road and how do I want to make that connection and at what point do I stop <laughs> so um, the, the hardest thing to do with these long closings is really to keep an eye on the clock and, um, and, and try to make it seem like you're not getting paid by the word do you so. think you have an advantage in a in a in a in a long trial let me ask you this for, for this reason. Um, in, a, in, in, a, in a long trial, in a longer trial, you're, you're, you're with the jury for a significant period of time. They, they get to see you, they get to know you, they get to see you in action. You have a longer bit of time to establish that you're the credible, caring, compassionate person in the courtroom there's more opportunity for them to see that the state is maybe not the prosecutors coming in and the, the white knight, you know, just the good guys. And they're just going to kind of dot their I's and cross their T's. Maybe in a longer trial, I'm wondering if you think that the judge is no longer viewed as just the good guy, because, you know, because you're together for a long time, there's more opportunity for them to begin to lean with you one way or the other. What do you think about that? I, I certainly think that's a way of looking at it, but the problem with looking at it that way is that means more evidence is coming in against your client. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's two aspects to it. I, I mean, if the case is, uh, it is tried in a certain way, then yes. I mean, I'm, we're always trying to try our case through the prosecution's case. I don't think that's any secret. So in light of that, um, the longer we're, they're up there is really the long, longer we're up there. Um, but there are some drawbacks to a longer trial and people want to go on with their life. They want to go home. And there are times where you're really trying to get things in into evidence and, and, and you have to wait till your end of the case to do that. And by the time you're there, uh, they've heard enough, they've had enough, and, and it's a very difficult thing to do. So. I really don't have a, a long-standing answer to that that, that really works uh, in all how about, cases. How about dealing with, how about the expectation when you come into cases, you're Jose Baez, you are a known commodity now. Um, I'm not saying you weren't five years ago or 10 years ago, 
but you've established yourself. I mean, you've, I think you were on a TV show at one point. Was it called like Power of Attorney or something like that? Was that the show for a minute? You the uh, jury. Yeah. You the jury. <laughs> um, and you represent, you've been involved in some very high profile cases. Um, you're certainly one of the more recognized and, and accomplished lawyers out there today. Um, so is, is there, a, is there a, a greater pushback, you think, from some judges because of who you are? I think I get more from the judges than I do the jury. And, uh, you know, I, um, look, I learned very early on in my career, don't look for help on the bench because it's not there. Nope. So, <laughs> that's, uh, a, that's a tower. There, there's, there, there's yeah. Rapunzel's not throwing you uh, <laughs> a, that's right. a, that's right. a way to get out or get in, right. So I, I tell my clients very early on in our representations that look, whatever we get from the from the court, that's a bonus. Uh, we're not going to expect it. We're not going to go in and, and and file motions expecting to win them. If we do, hey, that's wonderful. Uh, and we're going to have situations where we believe the law says one thing, and the judge disagrees. So. For that reason, um, I, I try to always look at a case initially from its from the worst perspective, and if it gets better along the way, even better. But well, we're going to try this case as it stands, and and that's that's really how you take the judge out of it. But yeah, it, it, it's a lot of judges think I, you know it's it's interesting because it's not just in my professional life; it's also in my personal life where people have a certain impression of me and it really is not who I am um, I, they they think I'm an incredibly serious person and when I'm anything but and um, they don't know how to take me when they hear me joking around and, and, and things like that so um, I don't behave that way in a courtroom but I do when when things are a little looser and, you know, and, and we're not in exactly in the moment. So I think professionally judges have this impression that I'm somehow brash, egotistical, going to come in and, 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 and stir things up and, and, and nothing could be further from the truth. I really try my best to be respectful to each and every jurist, uh, including prosecutors and and uh, and judges, but they need to know and understand that I'm there to do a job and not there to make friends. But at the same time, I'm incredibly respectful towards them, even if they're not that way towards me. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fall for that. So, where did you get um, in that? Where did you get in that in the practice? Tell me about your introduction to where you introduce yourself to the um, to everybody. I don't. I mean, in the courtroom, the prosecutors, the judge, the court reporter, the bailiffs, the the jury. W where did that start? And um, have you ever gotten any pushback from that from from a judge or anybody at all when you do that in the courtroom? Uh, you, you're talking about. Um, are you referring to when I um, I'm about to present evidence or cross examine or something along the, in the yeah, court? Yeah, the first. The first time you stand up in the courtroom for that day, I you, good morning, you know, may it please the court, and then you you turn to everybody. Well, I, I believe in courtroom decorum. I, I believe uh, it's a formal place, and 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 I believe everyone should be addressed. And I, I've never had an, a situation where it's been taken the wrong way. And I think the reason for that is because I'm that way all the time, whether the jury's in the room or not. I'll walk in the room and I say hi to everyone. I, I, I don't ignore anyone. Um, I, Cause, cause I, by, the I time you're, by the time you're done with it, I mean, I, you know, you can hear the jurors. You're like, and good, you know, good morning, you know, and they're like, and they respond. I mean, I, yes. I, you know, the, the reality is though, is I am that way whether the jury's in the room or not, I'll walk in the room and if the prosecutor's been there, I'll, I'll give them a hearty good morning. I'll, I'll chat it up with them. I'll do the same thing with the courtroom staff. Um, I, I, I don't know what it is. I guess I get, I get hyped up in the mornings 
And um, I walk in knowing that I'm blessed to, to, to be able to practice law and to do it in a place. Uh, usually it's, it's somewhere that's not my home. And I think to myself, of all the lawyers in this state, this person went all the way to Miami to find me. And it's such a privilege and an honor to do this. And, and as bad as uh, and as serious as the situation may be, I've got to be grateful and humble for my blessings. And, and that entails acknowledging everyone. So it's who I am. It's not an act. It's not, um, it, it's, it's genuine. And I, I believe most people recognize that. So, so when it comes out in the courtroom, it, it's, it's never an issue. It's a really but, wonderful, I, I watched, it's, it's, a, it's, it's wonderful. It's, it seems genuine. You don't seem like it's, doesn't appear contrived at all. And I bring it up because I've watched a couple of, in the Husel trial, I watched some of the prosecutors almost try to do it themselves. And they sort of tripped over themselves because I don't think it was sincere. It was almost like they were doing it because you were doing it. And they were trying to, to also appear to be likable as opposed to really being likable. That makes there sense. There was a lot of that going on in the Husel trial. And it's, it's kind of funny. Um, there were multiple times that I, I, I turned to Diane and I go, is he doing me? <laughs> and she, you know, we're cracking up and she's like, yeah, but he's, he, he never does that. Um, so, you know, it, it's kind of funny. Uh, and I've had that happen even recently. Um, and, and look, hey, I, I, I can take someone poking fun at me and, and it's all in good, it's all in good humor, but if you're doing it, uh, to impress the jury and that's not you well you're gonna fall on your face so it I, seemed I, very insincere but when they did it i picked up on it i'm not even in the courtroom you and i have never tried a case together and i and i all of a sudden i i, I watched the guy do that and i thought oh he's stumbled over that he's trying to actually out he's trying to out endear himself <laughs> he's trying to like falsely endear himself to the jury and it didn't come across and he got red face. It was not sincere. Yeah. The bald no. guy, you know what I'm talking about? It, it was it, not yes, that's what I was referring to. He did that. He did that with a lot of different things that I do in the courtroom. He would, it, it's, I don't know if he was trying to mock me or he said, Hey, that seems like a pretty good idea. Let me do that. Or, or what, I, or maybe he's been that way all along, but. Um, Neither it, are good things to do. If you're, if it's not your part of your personality, you don't want to mock somebody in the courtroom and you certainly don't want to emulate, try to copy them if that's not your, your personality. Right. Well, I'll disagree with you on one thing because I do mock prosecutors quite a bit. I know, I know. We're not talking about fantasy forensics anymore. We're talking about cold, hard evidence. Evidence that points to one person, and one person only. And he could get up here and lie all he wants and dance around the truth, but the truth is the truth. And, he, and depending on who's asking the questions, whether it's this laughing guy right here or whether it's myself. Objection. <laughs> you know, that really comes from, um, since I was a kid, I, I always did impersonations. And um, I would say about nine out of 10 of my clients, I, by the end of the case, I've got their voice down pat. Yeah. And, I'll, and I'll always... <laughs> Bro, you know, I always, uh, you know, hit them up in, in front of the team and we'll crack up and have a few jokes. But by the end of the trial, I, I usually have a prosecutor's uh, demeanor as well. Um, and, and that's just the kid in me. But, you know, I, you, no one could be a better you than you. So I, I think for, for folks who want to do this for a living, they should always remember to, to bring yourself to the court and bring an aspect of yourself because Everyone's really fascinating. You know, I, I, Neil, I would love to, I know I'm being uh, interviewed here, but I'd love to hear one day, sit down and hear your story and hear what drives you and what are you passionate about? And what is, what's the hardest thing you've had to overcome in your life? And I find that fascinating because I think we all have this, these incredible stories from this beautiful thing called life. And, and for that reason, it, it's such a, special thing that we really don't take advantage of enough and if you can bring that into a courtroom and show jurors that uh, and, and have them learn about your client I, I think that's half the battle right there
what do you do? I mean, I, first of all, I, I, I don't think I'm nearly as interesting as you, as you would think. Um, uh, well, that. <laughs> I, but I certainly would welcome that the opportunity at, at one point. Um, and it's a really beautiful way to look at things. Um, do you, does that come across, do you think, when you have the chance to individually voir dire jurors? Do you talk to them sort of that way and get a chance to actually interact with them like that? I wish you could. I wish I could. Um, unfortunately, you usually don't have the time. And I think, I, I, I think if you're going to get to know someone, you've got to invest the time in it. Uh, otherwise, it just seems, otherwise, you're just going to get the superficial aspect of who they are. Or who they who they put out there to be um, to really get to know someone someone you really have to ask uh, deep sincere questions and I don't think um, Baudire lends itself to that so during Baudire I, I like to do a lot of you know I like to do a lot of teaching as well as I like to do a lot of um, general theme work as it relates to the case. And, and also try and get as much as you can from the actual jurors themselves. Sometimes you spark up a general conversation, a person will take it and, and bring it home to them, apply it to themselves, and you learn something about them. And, and I think that's probably the best you're going to get when it comes to voir dire. Um, individual voir dire is a, it's, it's a lost art, and it's, and Every day it's being taken away from us as, as defense lawyers. So um, you really have to address that case by case. You know, you, you, I'm, you I'm sorry. Use a jury, no, no. Do you use a jury consultant or juror questionnaires? Do you do you use those things or I I believe, I I used to use jury consultants and I've been involved with cases where the stakes are so high that either co-defendants or, or even the client prior to me coming on board have, have hired these consultants. But I have really found them to be not as useful as I originally thought they would be. And um, I, however, what I like to do is if I can have them, that's a bonus. But that doesn't mean I have to always listen to them or follow what they say and, 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 and treat it like dogma. Because the reality is, is nothing should take you away from your instincts. You're in the room. It, you're facing the person. You're the one having the conversation with them. So your trial instincts have to always be there. And it's always good to hear a different perspective. And it's also good to have someone solely dedicated to jury selection. So for those reasons, I find it beneficial. But I, I've tried more cases than not and won more cases than not without jury consultants. So it, it's not a part of my game uh, unless it, it's part of the, the, you know, the package of the case. And if that's the situation, then, then sure. I, I'm, more information is always better. Do the jurors ever react to you being when they see that you are on the case? I mean, like I said, do they ever like, Oh my God, that's Jose Baez. I know you, or I, or, or I really am a fan or, I don't like you or they think you're a hired gun or do any of your prior cases come up during jury selection? I'm fascinated to know if that's something that you have to deal with. I Whether usually, it's a positive or a negative, I don't know. I usually don't get, I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in, in light of all of but that. Put me on one of your juries and I'll say the guy's great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, but I will say that um, many times jurors recognize me and and but there are times they don't say that they've recognized me. So, for example, in the Husel case, when the judge asked, "Does anyone recognize any of the lawyers?" None of them said they recognized me. But in the middle of, the, I guess, the first few days of the case, as you may remember, um, a couple of jurors had a conversation about me, and they recognized me, and they started talking about me, and and that's brought it, and another juror brought it to the court's attention, so we had to start quad diaring witnesses, I mean jurors, and, and try to find out what was said and what they think, and so on and so forth. Um, when that happens, that's great, because it brings it to the forefront, and we get to discuss it, and you get to truly know how people feel, and hey, any more, any more you can talk to the, local, to the jurors, the better, whether it's in chambers or not, uh, if it stops the trial, it doesn't matter. 
the more interaction you can have with them one on one, uh, I, I think is only helpful. So when that happened in this in 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 the Husserl trial, I welcomed it and was more than happy to discuss it. And if someone has an issue with some of my prior clients, which many people do, um, I, 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 tr I hope and I pray and we try to convey to them that that person doesn't even know this person and that this person deserves their day in court. And surely if it were you or someone you loved, you'd want the same thing. And so I, I want to ask about two subjects before we before I get to the end of this this chat. The judge in the Husel trial seemed to be overly interactive with the jury to me. He seemed like he was okay, okay, okay. And he had so it was seemed like it was almost like, I don't want to be overly critical, but I'll be critical. He appeared to me like a judge who almost was trying out for his post-retirement, like, where do I get my TV show kind of a gig? He had a couple of stories, okay, and I, you know, it was, a referee, as far as I'm concerned, should not be engaging that much with, with others that are also watching. You know, I mean, it was almost like he became a pillar of a personality in the case. And I, and I, that, that bothered me. And I was wondering how, because there got to a point where the tension in that courtroom was palpable through two dimensional television and a computer monitor. I could only imagine if I was in the courtroom, what it was like. It was a very contentious case. Uh, it was a constant battle every single day. And a lot of negativity was thrown around in that courtroom to the lengths of perhaps I may not have ever seen before. And, and that included all the parties. So it, it was one of those situations that was incredibly difficult to maneuver through. And, um, you know, as it relates to a judge, it's my opinion that a judge should always fade out into the background. This case is not about you. This case is not about, um, you know, uh, what you're doing after this. It's not about re-election. It's not about um, looking good in front of the jury. It, it's not about any of those things. So um, that's always a difficult challenge because, you know, uh, you don't want to get off on the wrong foot with the judge and you don't want them to take it out on your client. So I'll tell you, I, I take a lot of I take a lot of heat from the bench simply because I don't I'd rather come to me than have to go towards my client or or perhaps any decisions that may affect that uh, may affect him or her. So for that reason, it's inc it's incredibly difficult. Even when you know what they're doing is wrong, you don't approve of it, and and sometimes. Calling them out is the best thing you can do uh, because um, then they're more alert to it and, and they'll go out of their way to be friendly. <laughs> and then sometimes, no, it just throws gasoline on the fire and, and you've got a mess. So it's very unpredictable. And I, I'm a firm believer that if, if you um, shoot the king, you better shoot the kill. So in, in, the situation, if we don't have enough to recuse the judge, bite your tongue. And, and I hate doing that because that's not me. Uh, that's not my my nature as, as a person. I like to speak up and and, and I, I don't like being taken advantage of, like, just like everyone else. Um, and um, it was it was a very contentious case is all I'll say. And, and I, I, am, I, I am grateful every day that, that the case turned out the way it did. And I, I spoke with the jurors. Uh, Diane and I went to a, a party afterwards that the jurors threw that, that also had the judge there. So we all got to interact with our guards down. Uh, the only people who didn't come were the prosecutors. Um, but they were invited. So, um, <laughs> but they, Listen, that was... That was a that was a social. I mean, 
all the cases that I've that I've watched you try, the, the the they're big, and they're they're big acquittals, and they were significant verdicts. But the the William Husel case had a transcendent, it it had a a, a socially important impact and meaning beyond the individuals that were involved. He had a doctor that was so, he was revered by everybody two, a, a month ago and all of a sudden he's like, he was the guy, right? He's the fall guy. I, I think, I, and I'll share something with you that, that I, it's, I'm not, it's, it's hard to brag about, but that case brought me so much tension and stress leading up to it and and during it um i had lots of anxiety and i never i have never experienced that with a case before where i knew what the consequences were and, and i i imagined and envisioned the patience that would follow should he have gotten convicted and the pain that they would have to go through so in researching our case getting it ready to, to try I, I got to see videos and, and, and learn about bad deaths and, and how horrible that situation is, not only for, for the families, but for the individual themselves. I, I can't imagine the anxiety of death and, and doing it in a way that's such, when you're in so much pain. I mean, we've all had, uh, we've all caught in the flu or, or had colds where we just feel terrible and we've been to that point where we've had so much pain that we just want it to end and we don't care at what cost. Um, I can only imagine at the very end what that's like. And, and it was such a scary case for, for me to try. And, and, and I, 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 I thank God every day that we were able to pull that one out. And it was a really <laughs> meaningful moment, Jose. I'm telling you as... I, I had the, the, the privilege to cover that case um, with, um, you know, with Linda. Um, I peer, you know, on Wednesdays with her for an hour or so on law and crime. And, and we were just, you know, and Linda's a rock star. She's an awesome lawyer in and, in and of herself. But we just had a, as we're watching this trial, just the, the commentary, just the, the thought that, I mean, you're talking about people who are, you want doctors to start second guessing what they should do, what they shouldn't do. I mean, you know, how much pain should a person be in? We've all been there when a loved one is, you know, been, I mean, I, you, you just say, you know, they want it to end. You know, I don't want to see my loved one suffer anymore. And the idea that you're going to just going to keep them going to, going to judge the jo the doctor in these, in this horrible way. Cause had he been convicted, God forbid. Yeah. It would just I, cause doctors to have to, right? It would cause them to have to almost pause and stop and think, I, I'm not going to put my, let's get the lawyers involved. And where are we as we're treating this person? And oh, just, let, let me tell you, it, it's, it's terrible. The, the, uh, the chilling effect that this case had, I mean, we had experts that we wanted to use, but they would, they were getting, they were catching, uh, political trouble and being threatened by their bosses to not testify. Uh, we had some, we had, we had the hardest time lining up experts to, to testify because not because of, of, of the dose amounts or anything like that, but because of the stigma that would be attached to them and their fear of getting charged themselves. So I, I tell you the true heroes of the, of the Husel case were nurses and I and I I know I mentioned this during closing, and I thought about it during the trial that if I were one of these nurses and I got fired, vilified in the media, and I'm now doing something completely different, I'm no longer in a profession because I got sent to the to you know my license either suspended or or, or taken away, I would be angry at William Houston because that was his decision. And I was just following orders, but not a single one of them was angry with them. And the only and the only logical reason behind it was, despite all they went through personally, they still spoke up for the man because they worked with him every single day, and they got to see what kind of a 
person he was, what kind of a doctor he was, and who was in the best position to help these folks. And they saw him save lives day in and day out to know this man was not a killer. And, and anything, um, anything to the contrary was preposterous. And it was an affront to not only the doctor, but to the nurses, to the staff, and everyone who works selflessly to, to, to try and save folks' lives. And, and nowhere was that more apparent during the COVID times where unfortunately that community did not have the benefit of one of its best doctors. And I think that caused, mm. uh, I think that lives were lost as a result of William Houston being charged. So for that reason, I, I, am, I am grateful of the result and I'm even more grateful for these nurses who were brave and stood up and, and, and fought for not what was in their best interest, but for what was right. And you don't see that in the courtroom every day. You're right. It's, we don't. It's rare. And, and you know that. And, and do. how often do people say, I just don't want to get involved? Don't involve me. And, and, um, and I, I thought that was such a, I mean, I could talk to you about all your cases, but I really wanted to ask you about that because I thought it was such a significant, um, it was just such a significant moment. And the weight of the, you could just tell. I mean, you could cut the tension with a knife in there because of how important it was. And they all sort of, in the end, turned, I don't want to say they all, the state decided and it, with the assistance of whomever the, the was it the bean counter or the, was an insurance company or whomever it was that ultimately decided, I forget who, they had a memo that they even gave you a hard time about using saying that he's the guy, he's the villain. I think it was the word, right? The villain. Right, villain. Yeah. Villain. He's a villain and the nurses were villains, co-villains. I mean, you, you couldn't have said it any better. So really an incredible, in, incredible, incredible trial. And I think that if I, I just want to say that I, I think we're all better off every time a case is tried, the government is held to its burden. We're able to get in there and connect with jurors and a jury says not guilty because it makes the prosecutors overall, it makes them all have to work harder I don't want to say it raises the burden, but it defines the burden better. It helps us identify and it helps crystallize the presumption of innocence. If that person could be found not guilty, then average Joe can be found not guilty in a case, right? I mean, and that's one of the things that I think you do so well, Jose, is that you, 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 you crystallize how uh, uh, presumption of innocence and the burden of proof is available to everybody because you're, you're getting it. You're getting jurors to see it in these massive cases where the public starts off almost rooting against your client. And then in the end, we're, we're all cheering you when you, get a, when, you, when, when you get an acquittal. And if it works for you in those cases with those clients, it's got to help out with some of the, with some others, right? It has to. I, I certainly hope so. And, you know, we can only try one case at a time. But um, but yes, I mean, I, I I'm always I, I try my best to, to mentor younger lawyers and and, and to and, and to share as much as I possibly can because I, I do think that constitutional principles are are not a joke. Man. We we fight for them and, and have our service members fight for these freedoms every single day. Uh, as a veteran myself, I don't I don't take that for granted, and and I recognize how lucky we are to have the life we live, and, and we're so fortunate to to enjoy some of the rights we have. But but they're not rights if they're not applied, and, and they're they're just written words on a piece of paper until they're brought to life. And 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 the fact that I get to do that in a courtroom and 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 and, and sometimes help people. Um, that's, that's all I can ask for in this well, life. God bless you for it, man. So I, I appreciate it. God bless you. Yeah, you let, me, too. let me ask, <laughs> I'm going to leave you with this. Um, I, I always like people, not that they don't know how to find you, but, uh, if someone wanted to look you up, um, website, where would they look you up? Uh, how would they reach out to you? Give us your Instagram. Uh, I don't know if you're on Twitter, but I know you're on Instagram. I know you're on on the internet kind of laid on us pretty straightforward buyslawfirm.com and uh on instagram same thing buy his law firm so 
All right. Try to keep it simple. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Jose, thank you for making time for for me and the those that follow the Killer Cross Examination podcast. I wish all of you in in uh, in Florida, uh, those of you who were touched by the hit by the hurricane and those that aren't and had some ancillary uh, uh, impact. I hope everybody's safe down there. I know um, uh, I, I, I just wish you the best, man. And I can't thank you enough for appearing on the podcast. Thanks so much, Neil. I appreciate it and I enjoyed it very much. Thank you, man. Take care.